Good morning, New Life. Good morning. We welcome you all here this morning. Those who are watching online, we ask that you would stand and worship with us.
excited to have y'all here. My name is Lindsay. I work um, kind of behind the scenes on everything. Um, I haven't been officially given this title, but I feel like I'm Pastor Lori's stand-in, which is a huge honor. I'm like, woohoo, yeah, I'll take it. So Pastor Lori isn't here today. She's not feeling too well, so y'all be praying for her. Uh, we love you, Pastor Lori, if you're watching online. So welcome. We are going to open this service with some prayer. Okay, everything we do, guys, we want to just, prayer is like the foundation, and so we want, we want the Lord in it, right? So sometimes we got to slow down and stop, and let's ask Him, let's invite Him in, let's put our, our wants and our desires, put those down, put anything that is in between you and the Lord, whatever is hanging you up, just, it's time to put it down. Today's the day. That's what I, I was praying this morning, and that's what I felt the Lord say, like, today is the day. Let's lay down those heavy things that just, it makes it hard to run our race with Christ, right? So let's lay those heavy things down today. Submit to the Lord. Surrender to the Lord. He loves you. You are loved, okay? So listen, I get real nervous up here praying sometimes, so y'all pray with me. If y'all are real quiet, I'll be like, what's going on? So let's do this. It's called a concert prayer. Y'all, let's just honor and praise the Lord in prayer, okay? All right. Father God, thank you for this day that we are able to come into your house today and worship you and praise you and and get and just lift a, a, a song of praise to you, Lord. Lord, I ask that your presence would be in this place today, that you would saturate everything we do today, that today will be a new day for so many of us, Lord. Lord, I pray for the lost in this community, that they would come here. And even if they don't know why, Lord, they would come here. And not only would they come here, they would come here and have a real encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord. Jesus, we are here to be a light on the hill, a light in the darkness, a city on a hill, Lord. So let them come, God, and let them meet you, Lord. Even if it's, again, for the millionth time, Lord, let them come. If it's for the first time, let your kingdom be furthered, Lord. Lord, be in this place today with our praise and worship team, Lord, as they lead us close, deeper and deeper and closer and closer to the Holy of Holies where you are, Lord, that they, they're giving up these talents you gave to, gave to them, Lord, back to you in worship, in honor, and for your glory, Lord. Lord, I pray for, for this congregation, the people here and the people online, Lord. I pray you would soften their hearts to receive from you today, God, from you. Every fiery dart from the enemy I cast back to hell in Jesus' name. The devil will not be successful today, Lord. He will not be successful today. He is under our feet, and we are going to praise your name. We're going to praise you today, Lord, no matter what this week has looked like, no matter what we're battling, Lord, because you are worthy. Even we, when we are down in the dirt and it feels like we're being stomped on, you are still worthy of our praise. And so no matter where we are today, emotionally, Lord, spiritually, Lord, how dirty we are, Lord. We just come to you as we are. And Lord, I pray that you would change us and we would leave changed, Lord. You would be honored and glorified in all, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, you called me out of darkness. You silence every lie.
by your blood I've been
miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. A way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness.
Can you say amen? You know, when we say amen, a lot of times we just say that as a response. The word actually means yes. So be it. Let it be so. I don't know about you, but I want God before me and behind me. I want Him beside me and all around me. Aren't you glad that He made that promise? You know, we were talking in our foundational series that we ended last week how He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. That's not somebody else's promise. That's not just something you read in some fairy tale somewhere. That's what He said. He said it several times. He said, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. And Jesus said, I'll go with you even to the end of the age. He's always with us. Somebody say amen. And he's here right now. I don't know if you can feel what I feel. But I'm telling you, I, 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 I like it what my pastor in Monroe used to say. I love to feel like I feel when I feel like I feel right now. Amen. When I feel the presence of God in the house. I want to tell you something that happened to me just a second ago. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if this means anything to you or if you felt what I felt. And that if you don't believe this, that's okay. Because I'm fine with just being me right how, how I am with God. Amen. Is that all right? I'm sitting there worshiping the Lord. And, and, and Melissa was singing about how he's here, right here with us. We were singing this song, how he's here, right here with us. And I said, Lord, touch me. Touch me today, God. And I, lit, I felt something on my arm. And, and, I, and, I, and I looked. I don't know if you saw me, Charlene, or you guys may have saw me. I did like this. I looked beside me like this, and I thought, who's touching me? Because often people come to tell me stuff. Brother Earl, Papa Earl told me something just a second ago that I needed to take care of and remind me. But there was nobody there. I literally feel like I felt the hand of the Holy Ghost. And you say, well, I don't know if you could do that. That's okay. I don't know if you can either, but I felt something touch me. Physically touch my arm. I believe he's right here with us. I believe he's everywhere we go. He's not just in us, but he manifests his presence with us in our praise, in our worship, to be with us, to help us, to protect us. He's the defender behind us. He's the banner before us. He's our cloud during the day, our fire during the night. He's our manna every morning. He is everything. He is all in all. Somebody give him some praise in the house. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. That's who he is. <laughs> and also, he's everywhere else too. He's omni. Remember we said last week, what does that mean? All. Omni. Omni means all. Present means everywhere. He's everywhere all at once. He's everywhere all at once. He is God. And he is everywhere and he is for us. Amen, somebody? Now, right after that, you see Pop Earl just taking care of some business. That's okay. He does that quite often. Y'all just be all right with him. It's like a baby crying. You know what I'm saying? You've heard it before. It's all right. Don't worry about it. He's just doing what I tell him to do. In fact, we're going to receive from communion in just a little bit, and we'll ask you again. But if you didn't get one, throw your hand up, and we'll get one to you. There's a couple right here. And we'll ask you again because some people come in different ways, and they... And they, and they uh, you know, come in at different times. We want to make sure that everybody has the elements that they want if they want to, to uh, there you go, participate. I had a Mel Tillis moment. So, um, anyhow, so I'm worshiping the Lord and I really felt his hand. I believe that. I felt the hand of God touch me. Something physically touched me. And I looked over and there was nobody there. And so then just a few minutes later, I was worshiping, and I raised my hand up, and I hit somebody. And I said, now, I know that's not you. <laughs> uh, look, and it was Papa Earl. <laughs> he was telling me something that I needed to know. So anyways, I believe God's here right now. Amen. He's wherever you are. He's wherever you are. You know, and, 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 and that's, a, that's a comfort for us. That should be. Because there are times when it's just us and God. There are times when you feel like you're all alone. There are times, several, some, some of our people right now, some of our loved ones, some people very close to us right now, maybe in the hospital, for instance, or in a nursing home. Well, in certain places in this country still, they're not allowing you to go in, and, 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 and they're, they're there, what, what seems like by themselves. But can I promise you this? Even though they can't, you can't be there with them, they are not alone. They are not alone. 
the spirit of the living God is there with them because I know his promise and he said I won't leave you I won't forsake you he didn't say unless they won't let me in the ICU he didn't say unless they won't let me in, in, the, in the retirement center or in the nursing home. He didn't say that. He said, I'm going with you to the end of the age. There's not one second you're going to pass in this life or outside of this life that I'm not going to be right there with you. That's good. He's God. And he's with us. So you can call on him anytime. You can depend on him anytime. He's right there just to whisper away. And he manifests himself in our praise. Aren't you glad that he's here and he, and he makes himself known? He's not God who's trying to be, he's not trying to play hide and seek. He's not. And you know, there are times when it seems like he says, look for me, try to find me, come, come on and, and press in. You know, that's for our purpose, right? That's not because you can't find him. It's because he wants you to, cook, to come looking. He wants you to grow. He wants you to move closer and closer and closer and closer. If you notice the pattern of worship, when you walk through the gates, there's a big crowd. When you go through the next gate, the crowd gets smaller. When you go through the door, the crowd gets smaller. And then when you finally get in the presence of God, there's just one in the Old Testament model. Here's what I want you to know. you got to press into the very presence of God you got to reach for him sometimes. And what he wants us to understand is don't feel strange when you look around and the crowd gets smaller because you're pressing closer. Because that happens. Be encouraged. And know that you're still headed towards him. You're still headed towards him. But he doesn't play hide and seek with us. And when he does, when he wants us to do, to find him, he plays hide and seek like I used to play with my kids. Right? I don't know. You remember that, Haley? When I was little, or when she was little, I was littler. She was little, I was littler. How about that? I saw a picture of, of, of she and I the other day, and, uh, it, you know, she's getting ready to graduate, so I was looking back through some things, and, and uh, she's graduating from college. Amazing. <laughs> from the first part of college, anyway, she takes a little bit of break, and then she'll be going to medical school and not too long from now. And, uh, but I was looking at when she was little, and I remember... We used to play this game, and, uh, you know, it started off really easy. You know, anybody ever play peekaboo? That's the easy one, right? But she used to hide herself. That's what she'd do. She'd go, where's daddy? <laughs> so all I had to do was just sit there. I don't know. Where is he? Peekaboo, that's what she'd say. Yeah, there you are. You know, then it was hard because then she would go, where's daddy? And that meant she wanted me to get up and hide. But I couldn't hide really well because she was little and couldn't find me. So I would hide and just kind of like Clay's hiding behind that, that, that podium right there, that music stand. Where's Daddy? I don't know. Where is he? You know, there he is. Are you sure? No, he's not. And then we'd run around and play. And then the point is this. Daddy wanted to be found. She wanted to find me. And Daddy wanted her to find him. That was the game. That was the point. And see, your heavenly Father wants to be found. Sometimes He wants you to push in. Sometimes He wants you to search. But He's not hiding so you can't find Him. He just wants you to move closer, that's all. And know that He's always there. I know that's a paradox for us. But even when He seems like He's not there, He's there. Amen? He's there. He's there. I'm just, I, 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 I just so grateful for Him today. I love you, Lord. Oh, Lord, and when we come together on a day like today, God, on Palm Sunday, where we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem to start the Holy Week, what we know as Passion Week, Lord. And we come together in this house, Lord. We, we are reminded, and God, it's physically evident to us that when you entered in, you never left again. You're here right now with us. And I thank you, Lord. I bless you. I praise you, God, because I need you. And you're here. And that's your promise. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sing it, Melissa, real slow.
darkness or my doubt that is who blessing right now over all your people God before we move on I just thank you that in the cross that you did everything that needs to be done and God I just speak your blessing now over every voice over every person within the sound of my voice whether they're here in this room or listen to us on the internet or 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 or, or, or in a recording later on God I, I just I just speak blessing and healing and favor and life over them now in the name of Jesus, your word tells us that by your stripes that we were healed, that by your blood that we were set free, that in you and at the cross that you accomplished all things so that we can have it. Be healed in the name of Jesus right now. Be set free right now in the name of Jesus. Be delivered right now. All you got to do is just reach up and receive. Just claim it and proclaim it. It's not, about, it's not about name it and claim it. It's about just receiving what he's already done. In the name of Jesus, it's real and actual. We bless you, Lord. We thank you and we love you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Every sickness go. Every confusion go. Every mind-binding spirit in the name of Jesus. We arrest you now. Take your hands off of the people of God. Take your hands off the temple of God. You have no authority. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for making the way. Thank you, Lord, that even if we don't see it, especially when we don't see it, you're working and doing what you do. Because that is who you are. That is who you are. Now we receive it, Lord. You said it and we believe it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Give the Lord one more hand of praise, will you? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Will you hand me that stuff right there? Yeah. Y'all can come on and, 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 and bring that over. Listen, I want you to stay right here and just keep playing, if you will. We're going to see how good you are. You're going to have to go one-handed. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. How about Brian Wood? Praise the Lord that we got talented people, amen, who can step in and fill in. We got them all over the place, and I'm just grateful and thankful to God. I, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to continue to worship and uh, worship with the Lord with your stewardship, the tithes and offerings if you haven't done so already. 
You can give uh, online. You can go to our mobile app. Um, there's information there. Um, if you're new here, there's information right in front of you, actually. You scan that with your QR scanner. Just pull up your photo app and just do that. It'll take you right to some places where you can give us information and go there. And then also online, if you click that little link that says new here, um, you'll, it'll take you there. Um, you can give physically here in the, in the service. We're not passing the plate, as it were, any longer, uh, or at least during this time. But we have some posted back here at the door on your way out. You can give that if you have, and uh, you can mail it in. Um, if you, maybe, you're, maybe you're across the world. I don't know. Um, but anyhow, however you want to do it, just remain faithful. Amen? God is faithful to us. Keep being faithful to Him. I paid $3 a gallon yesterday. For some diesel fuel. Anybody driving a diesel besides me? Just me. Only one that still hasn't figured it out yet, I guess. No, sir. There you go, right behind me. They're, they're driving one, too. Why you drive that diesel? Because it still works. Because it's a 2002, and it's got 270,000 miles on it, and it purrs like a big cat. You know what I'm saying? And goes down the road, and I'm going to drive it. My wife said, when are you going to, how long are we going to keep this? I said, well, I don't know. She said, how long are you going to drive it? I said, "Till we get rid of it or the wheels fall slam off of it and it can't be fixed anymore. $3 a gallon I paid for diesel yesterday, and I was frustrated about it. Anybody besides me? Um, Y'all should be frustrated because I was frustrated about it. I appreciate that. I like people who have some empathy and some sympathy. Thank you, Diane. But you know what? I, I got to thinking about it. I got in a car and I said, it's 80, $85, I believe it was, to fill up. I had almost a half a tank. Um, well, that, that thing has a 44-gallon tank, so <laughs> it's a big dog. Um, but I got in a car and I thought, $85 for half a tank. And then I said, thank you, Lord, that I'm able to get it. And I don't have to stress over the economy because things may get more expensive. Inflation may go. I don't know what's going to happen with economies and taxes and all this stuff. But thank you, God, that you're still blessing me every single day of my life. I'm blessed and highly favored by you. Amen? That's a fact. That's a reality. And that's just a practical application. You know why I believe God blesses me? I believe God blesses me financially for two reasons. Number one, because I'm his son and he loves me. Number two, because I'm obedient in stewardship. And I believe he's always going to take care of me. And he's always going to take care of everybody who will be obedient to his stewardship. Somebody say amen if you believe it. If you know it to be true. Amen? Amen. And don't forget, when you give to new life, you're giving through new life because we are, you're, look, God's using us to bless others and we're providing and doing everything we can to make sure that needs are met and that, that people know that God is on the scene and on the throne and He is their provider. Amen? Amen. Now, um, I, I want you to just keep playing all the way until, until we get to the commun through with communion, if you will. You all right with that? Okay. Just play a good communion song. You know one? I'm sure you do. If you don't, just play what you're playing. That sounds good. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a little bit while I'm doing this. So if you feel like flipping over to the organ, you can just go right there too. Mm -hmm. Right? Come on, y'all. Y'all can have fun, can't you? If you can't, me and her will just have fun. Y'all can just watch. Or should I say she and I? Is that right, Debbie? She and I. Bib City, we say me and her. Usins. That's, that's what they say in, in Newport, Tennessee, where my granddad is from. Usins. They say yins and usins. So, y'all, some of y'all know about that, don't you? Okay. I'm just, I'm just saying. Now, listen, we are going to start today... A, uh, a new series. And by the way, let me just say this to my beautiful bride who's at home under the weather, not feeling well today. We pray for you and all of the others who are, who, are, who are home today. We have actually a few who are struggling with different kinds of sicknesses. Some of it is pollen related. Some of it vaccine related. Some of it is, uh, is just woe out related. You know what I'm saying? 
Any of y'all, any y'all Southern enough to know what it means when you say, I'm just woe out? Yeah, rode hard and put up wet. Some folks just need to rest. And, you know, either way, we're, we're, we, we have this capability, and I'm glad we do. So, baby, I love you. Happy anniversary. And uh, today, 29 years ago, somehow the Lord put some kind of jinx on her mind. And uh, I, 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 I asked her, she, she, said, she said, what was I thinking? I said, I don't know, but I don't want you to stop thinking it. <laughs> right? 29 years ago today, the most beautiful woman I ever seen said yes, and I do. And uh, we've been together 31 years, married 29, and I'm just so excited for what the next, I don't know, 29 maybe. Is that good? How, how long is that? What's 53 and 29? Somebody who does math real good. Is that 53 and 29? That would be 79, 80, 81, 82, right? 82, I need more than that. Yeah, I need at least 100. I want to be 100. I told Lori, I want to live to be 100. She said, I don't want to be 100. I said, that's okay. You could be 97 because I'm three years older than you. Right? But anyhow, I want every day that God will give us. And uh, so I was just saying that. And some of y'all said, well, I don't get to say happy anniversary to my bride. That's because you ain't got the microphone. So if you want to have the microphone, then just let me know. and We'll make that happen for you. How about it? Um, I want you to go ahead and, uh, and get this ready. Uh, because if you're like me, uh, when a time comes, that first little top part there, um, it takes me a little bit. I'm, I'm struggling with it right now. Um, I may have to get my very smart, very talented daughter with fingernails. Oh, I got it. If you have never done this before, if you are at home and you don't have elements, uh, go grab something. If you have bread, grape juice, some kind of something, you can get crackers. Um, you say, well, is it, can you do that? Let me just tell you something. You know, we have these symbols because... You know, the Bible tells us that at Passover, they ate unleavened bread and drank fruit of the, fruit of the vine. And we do that. But I want to tell you one of the most powerful communion services I've ever been in in my life. I was in the Philippines uh, just about to preach. A, uh, we, we had been there for several weeks already, and we were just getting ready to go. We were in this neighborhood, and we used to go into the neighborhoods every day before we had... Um, before we had uh, the, the, the night services. During the day, we were building a church and then doing some stuff at the, uh, at the school that we helped sponsor there, the pastor training school. And, uh, but when, during the days, after we got done, we would get ready. Before we'd go have the crusades, is what they called them, these neighborhood crusades, we would go in there and do what they call reclaim the land. Reclaim the land. And some of y'all say, well, I don't believe in that. That's okay. They believe in it. Right? You say, well, is that real? It was really real while I was there. And so we went there, and this is what happened. We would gather in that neighborhood. They would walk around and pray all over that neighborhood and let people know there's a crusade coming that night and that there was going to be a missionary or evangelist there to preach. And uh, they come learn about Jesus. And then bring the kids because there's going to be something fun, and we're going to give you some food, right? And, and really, that was they should lead with that. Come get food and hear about Jesus. Um, but anyways, they would, they would do that. So we'd gather together, and we'd get in the circle, and they would do what was called reclaiming the land. And so they would have communion. We would have communion. We would have prayer. And then they would break up the communion and pour it into the ground. And you say, well, I don't know if that's real. It was just symbolic. Um, but there was some power in it, I'm telling you. There was some authority in it because we seen people... Ha, ha, just every night saved and delivered and set free this one particular time I'm telling you about they didn't have any unleavened bread they didn't have any regular bread they didn't have any 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 cup or, or grape juice or any way so somebody said w -w what do we have and one dude says I got a pack of crackers and another one said I got a Pepsi Cola Right? They had these 32-ounce bottles of Pepsi-Cola. How many remember 32-ounce bottles? They had 32-ounce bottle of Pepsi-Cola. And we had communion with soda crackers and Pepsi-Cola. And you say, well, can you do that? We did. 
And I'm going to tell you something. God moved right then on that place. In fact, there was a guy there. I'll tell you what happened. There was a guy there who had been following them all around as these students went out and, and were spreading the word. And he'd been mocking them. And he was, look, when you looked at him, he was about almost gold color. He was so jaundiced. And he was an alcoholic and demon possessed. And he was mocking them. And he was mocking us as we prayed. And he was mocking as we took communion. And when we got done, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost fell in that circle. And two of those students, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, just turned and took off running after that joker. And he took off down through the neighborhood. They chased him up into a house. Went in there, laid hands on him, cast that devil out of him, brought him to church that night. He got saved and delivered. And I watched his color change from yellow to normal in front of my eyes. And with him, more than 300 people were saved that night. So that's something to praise God about. And I give you that testimony just so you can know that it was all right, apparently, to the Holy Ghost, at least on that day, that we had communion with soda cracker and Pepsi Cola. Now, I'm not telling you to make a mockery of things. I'm not, I'm not telling you to, not to be traditional or not to, to respect the sacraments. What I'm saying is don't get caught up in, in, in so much legalism. It's all about the heart. The Bible says God looks at the heart. Amen? So get it ready. If you're at home, get something ready and, 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 and sanctify it before the Lord and we're going to worship Him. Amen? Amen, somebody. Come on, say amen. amen. I'm going to preach this thing whether you're with me or not, so you might as well get with me. We're starting this week a new series called The Passion. Seth wanted us to call it The Passion of the Christ. But I told him somebody had already used that one. So we asked Pastor Dustin when he was getting the graphic ready. You got that graphic up there? Yeah, he said, just put real tiny down in the corner, just of the Christ. So, but anyways, this is Holy Week. And we are going to start this new series. We're going to look at what took place during the last week of Jesus' life. This week we're going to look at all the way through Thursday. Next week we're going to look at the last three days because the last three days really stand alone. Amen. And it's Easter, so why wouldn't we? Right? It's Resurrection Sunday, so why wouldn't we look at that? Because that's what it's all about. But I want to start today by kind of tying in this message with this foundational series that we did and just moving right in. So last week we finished up the foundational series by looking at worship and war, abandoning ourselves to God and prayer. And what a powerful message reminder it was to help us see that God is trustworthy. That God loves us and He wants to communicate with us and save us and help us and pour His blessings out on us. And I don't know about you, but man, does that make you feel like it makes me feel to know that God is for me? Well, today is Palm Sunday, as we said. The day where we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem prior to the Passover week. That would forever be known as Holy Week. And many refer to it as the Passion Week. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take a look at that. And there are reasons that Jesus did what he did. And we're, hopefully when we finish this next little mini-series, that you're going to understand it better. But more than that, you're going to live it better. You're going to live in it better. You're going to walk in it and thrive in it better. Amen? I have one friend that says it like this. People don't do better until they know better. And I believe God wants us to know better so we can walk better. Amen? Now, that's not about what we do. That's about who we are. Amen? If you realize what Jesus did for you and who you are and how you live and walk in that, that's what makes it better. And because we're not going to have our Wednesday service this week, and uh, that's the service that we usually get together and have communion and, and foot washing, and, but with some of these restrictions still in place, and I'm going to be making some, some announcements about that in just a little bit, 
Um, we're going we're gonna to actually just kind of do what we did last year. Last year we didn't have an option. This year we're going to do it because we're choosing to because of some of the restrictions that are still in place. But we're going to let you have that day with your family and just celebrate it however you feel led of the Spirit of the Lord together as a family. And maybe you might just want to get together with your family and have communion again and time. of And, and maybe, you know, do foot washing. I know some people say, y'all still do foot washing? Yes, we do. And if you've never been part of one, I'm telling you, it's one of the most powerful services, powerful worship experiences that you can be a part of. You say, well, I don't want to do that. Well, Jesus did it. Well, he did an example. Okay, well, why don't you do it as an example? Your kids need to see you serving and loving and worshiping. Is that all right? Well, we're going to start off today with communion. Now, hopefully every one of you have your elements by now. And if you didn't, again, just hold up your hand and we'll get into you. In the balcony, y'all good? Let me talk to you a minute about communion. This is kind of a little bit of a continuation from last week, but also heading into this week. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Jesus said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And if you remember, we were talking about, last week we were talking about part of worship is proclaiming, speaking, Saying it out loud, living it out loud, proclaiming. And so Jesus says, you proclaim his death. The Greek word for the word proclaim is the word katangelo. Katangelo. Now, you spell that K-A-T-A-N-G-E-L-L-O. Katangelo. Well, let me break this down for you because words are important. And, it, and the roots of things are important. If you break those down to a phonetic speaking, it's K-A-T. Then the next section is A-N-G-E-L. What does that spell? Don't say angle. Unless you're from Bib City. Angel. And the last part is low. And see, what that shows us is this. It's a proclamation. The word just simply means to proclaim, to tell, to speak it. One definition is to herald it. That's why the word angel is in the middle of it, because the angels were the proclaimers, the messengers. And God wants us to proclaim His death until He comes. And so this verse tells us, that when we receive this, I'm going to show you another word that a lot of y'all associate with bad stuff. It's not really associated with anything but the Bible. The word's Eucharist. You ever heard that word? It's not a Catholic word. It's a Bible word. It comes from the Greek word, uh, Eucharisti, and it means to give thanks. It means to give thanks. And so can I tell you what Jesus is saying to us is when we partake of communion, we are proclaiming that he died for us and we are giving thanks to him before everyone. Well, some of you may say, well, why do we do that? Why do we proclaim his death? Why do we give thanks for his death? Because y'all, if you hadn't figured it yet, figured it out yet, that changed everything. His death changed everything. His death changed all of human history. Because of His death, our sins are forgiven. We can walk boldly into the presence of God. We can live and be the loved and be in His grace and have His blessing. We can be empowered from on high with, with, with power He gave us. We can be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit because of His death. And because his death also set up his resurrection. <laughs> I don't know if y'all getting this. Maybe y'all the pollen got y'all wore out. Communion. This right here. This. Jesus said represents my body which is broken for you. 
so that your body can be put back together. And can I tell you something? Not just your body physically, but your body in every way. And not just your body, but his body, the body, the body of believers, the body that he died for. Who did he die for? For God so loved, say it, the world. You remember right when he left this meal, he went to the garden and you can read in John 17 where he was praying for our oneness. For us to be one. For us to be one with him. For us to be one with each other. And for unity to take place in the body. And this world needs it. This culture needs it. And my body physically needs it. My spirit man needs it. So if you will, if you're able, can you stand with me right now? With your elements. The Bible said he lifted the bread. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. And he blessed it. Let's bless it. Father, thank you. That your son Jesus went to the cross for us. Lord, thank you for going to the cross for us. Thank you that by your broken body, by the, you being on the cross, that our sins are forgiven. That we are reconciled to you. That we now have the opportunity to be saved and to live with you forever. Restored back to that place that you wanted us to be, that our bodies can be healed, that our minds can be healed, that our spirit mans can be healed and free, that we can be whole in every sense of the word. Bless it now, Lord, as we remember and receive. Amen. You can receive. The Bible said, then he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the new covenant. The New Testament, we call it, and is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Aren't you glad for the blood? It seems so weird to celebrate someone bleeding, but had it not been for that, but thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Father, thank you as we receive now this cup, the cup of the new and everlasting covenant. Lord, wash us. Search us, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in us. Heal us, Lord God, through your blood. Forgive us again if necessary. Thank you for your blood. We receive and we remember because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise you, Lord. Now, would you just take about 30 seconds or a minute, would you just silently, or out loud, I don't care, would you just take a second and worship Him? Just from your own heart, from your own lips. You and your Father, and your Savior, Jesus. being seated right in front of you in the chair right in front of you there's a little bit of round thing it, it looks kind of weird but it's right there part of the little thing underneath the chair you can just stick that little cup there and the ushers will come by after the service and pick it up thank you Melissa and because you work so hard right now you don't have to come back no more <laughs> till next week 
Now let's begin this little mini-series. Let me talk about something that's going on in our world today. We just talked about unity and oneness in this, in this communion that we take. And uh, as I was studying this and I was, I was doing some research and I was gleaning from, from different places and even different people as I often do, this was brought into my remembrance and then also brought into my spirit. The Lord said, I want you to talk about this. You know, there's something going on in our world today and it's become very political in nature. But I want us to understand that it's not politics. And it's not social things. But it has a very spiritual root to it. And it's demonic in nature. Everybody understand what I'm saying to you? You with me? There's a movement, and it didn't just begin. In fact, it began a long, long time ago. Um, and it took an official face and name and identity. Um, back in, 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 in 1879, officially, actually, that's when somebody put a name on it. But it started years and years ago, and that is the hatred of the Jews. And I want to talk about something for just a second before we get into this last week. Because this was very important to Jesus. It's very important to the Word. It's very important to the Father. And it should be very important to you and I. Don't get uncomfortable. You're fine. Anti-Semitism, bigotry or hatred against the Jews has started raising its ugly head again in a passionate, fiery way. And this is because we're moving at a neck break speed I believe, into the end times. Now, we've been in the end times for more than 2,000 years, but we're getting closer and closer to the very end of this thing. And it's raising its head, and I don't care how you assign blame to it, it all goes to the devil. And believe it or not, the reasoning for this anti-Semitism is blamed on the Scriptures. Did you know that? The word Semite or Semitism originally referred to the people in the biblical Middle Eastern area who spoke the Semitic languages. That's Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic or the three major ones. There were some others, but those are the three major ones. That's all it meant. That's all that Semite or Semitism meant until the 19th century. Now, don't get me wrong. The people of God have been persecuted. The Jews have been attacked and taken captive and killed and, 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 and all of that all throughout their history. And there are many different reasons for that. But in 1879, a German journalist wrote an article on how the Germans were a superior race and how the Jews were an inferior race, 1879. Does that idea sound familiar to anyone? Then he founded what was called the League for Anti-Semitism. And at that point, Semitism began to refer strictly to the Jews, not just a people that spoke Semitic languages. And so you say, well, okay, let's blame the Germans. But while that will be easy to do, especially since Hitler and Nazi Germany and World War II and all the things that have followed that, it's actually started long before that. And sadly enough, do you know one of the biggest propagators? Now, get comfortable. Don't start ducking on me. But do you know one of the biggest proponents of anti-Semitism has been the church? Sadly, it has. People who called themselves Christians. Amazingly enough... And, and you may be heartbroken to find out that, see, this all ties in because this is Holy Week. This begins Holy Week. But one of the worst times, especially during the Middle Ages and, and just shortly after that, to be a Jew and be alive on this planet was during Holy Week. Because people who called themselves Christians would put crosses on their chest and raid Jewish villages and communities and pillage and kill 
and rape their women and take their children all in the name of Christ and say, this is because of what you did to our Lord. I want to tell you something. Some of you may be surprised to know, or maybe you know, but you need to remember that the first church was made up of all Jews. Well, no, 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 that was the Old Testament. No, it was the church. And by the way, your Savior is a Jew. (laughs) Jesus said that he was sent to the Jew first. And then the Gentile, Paul echoed this in his writings. Now, again, to be clear, the Jews have been under attack for a long time, but sadly the church has been one of the biggest culprits in a twisted lie by the devil. They base this on the book of John. See, John uses the term the Jews 63 times in his gospel. And I want to explain something to you and help you see something. Because this lie is being pushed. And people even trying to give it religious backing. And giving it some kind of substantiation and rationalization. But all it is, is a demonic, heretical lie. And I'm being passionate about it. Because I'm passionate about what God's passionate about. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke only use the term the Jews or the term Jews about six times each in their Gospels. John used it 63 times. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And actually, it originally meant and and very well should be translated when he was talking about it. If you look through the others, he means the Jewish leadership. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Those are the ones he was talking about. But they didn't understand why John did what he did. And it's because John wrote his gospel. Some, some, some theologians date it to the year 90 A.D., some 93 A.D., some 95 A.D. But if you take just a five-year period... Between 90 and 95 A.D. is where John wrote his gospel. The other gospels, what's called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were all written prior to A.D. 70. Well, you know what happened in A.D. 70? The destruction of the temple and the disbursement of the Jews. And so here's the thing. Some 20 to 25 years later, John writes his gospel. And he writes it a little bit different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote primarily about the last year of Jesus' life. That's all they wrote about, the last year of Jesus' life and ministry. They talked about the birth and a few other things, but that's pretty much where they focused. And they all pretty much are similar. That's what synoptic means, similar. But John wrote about the first two years of Jesus' ministry. And then he put some other things in there. And he tells different things. That's why you see a lot of different things in the book of John that you don't see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But by the time he wrote this in A.D. 90 or 95, can I tell you that most of the church at that point was Gentiles. And they would not have understood what John was talking about if he said Sanhedrin. Or Pharisees. And so he simply said phrases like the Jews. The Jews did this. The Jews did that. For fear of the Jews. And so people who didn't understand were twisted and misled by the enemy who wants to destroy everything he can about God and God's people. And it all started just like that. It's amazing to me how hated Listen, let me equate it to something that's going on in our country today. And again, I'm not trying to get political. I'm just telling you a fact. Is it amazing to you that everybody can do what they want to except Christians? Have you noticed that? I mean, honestly, have you noticed that? I told you guys, either last week or Wednesday, I can't remember which one, but Oral Roberts University has been playing. Have they played yet? Did they win? Ah! I wanted him to win it all. Just because. But old Roberts University was in the Sweet 16. They're not supposed to be there. Tiny little Christian school. 
Only lost by two. But there was an article came out by USA Today that said not only should they not be allowed to compete, but they shouldn't even be, be, be allowed to be involved in the NCAA because they are Christians and they are their, their, their beliefs against you know, same-sex marriage and, and all the other things that our culture pushes is heretical and, and offensive against human decency. How many articles have you seen against the Muslims? How many articles have you seen against any other religion? That stands against same-sex marriage. How many articles have you seen? You don't see it. How many times do you see people protesting in the street, the Hare Krishnas? Do you see it? Nobody says when they hit their finger, nobody screams out, Oh, Buddha! They don't. Because there's no authority and power in any of those. But in Jesus there is. And so, see, in our country that was founded on a belief and a search for God and to worship as you should, most of them Christians, by the way. Some of them deists, but most of them Christians. It's become very unpopular to be Christian. Very unpopular to be Christian. And we can relate to that, most of us. And so you relate that to the Jews and realize, why is it that everybody hates the Jews so much? Can't be just because they got diamonds over there. Right? Can't be because they're good businessmen or they don't like pork. I mean, I like bacon, but come on. You know why. You know why. And so John simply says this, and people get twisted about it. And so as we begin this Holy Week, and we've just taken communion, I just want to address this real quick. Is that all right? I'm going to anyways. This spiritually led, socially and politically charged, renewed movement to hate the Jews... And blame the Jews even for the death of Jesus? Can I tell you it's a lie? And then some say, well, it was the Romans that killed Jesus. They didn't kill him either. Some say, nope, it was my sin. I'm the one that killed Jesus. That ain't true either. Can I tell you who put Jesus on the cross? Jesus put Jesus on the cross. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. But I lay it down. It was his plan from the beginning. His will from the beginning. <laughs> so we could go through this week. So we could see what happens when they take the life of the Savior. But he said, I'm not staying here. If the devil would have known, the Bible says, he would have never done it. But he executed the greatest plan of God. And by his death and resurrection on the cross and from the grave, we have life eternal and redemption. That's what put Jesus on the cross. So can I tell you, Christians, the church is not anti-Semitic. New life, we're not anti-Semitic. You want to argue about that? Come see me. I usually don't want to fight and argue with that. Tell you don't email me. Let's go at it. I'm going to help you. We are not just anti or not just not anti-Semitic, but we are for the Jews. The Bible says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Bless those God bless those who blesses his people. And not only that, but we are for the whole world. Can I tell you something else? Because see, Christians get twisted up in a lot of things sometimes. We, don't only love, we not only love Jews, we also love Palestinians. That's right. We love the Jews and the Muslims. We love the Chinese and the Russians. We love the Americans. We love them all. Why? Because God so loved the world. I'm telling you, now I'm not talking about, you know, fear of politics and all that stuff. I'm talking about in your heart. And you better take a notice. And I know I'm being rough on you here for a second, but you better stop and take a notice because there is no room in the heart of a believer for bigotry and hatred and racism and all that stuff. It, there's no room for it. And if it's there, you better get rid of it. 
If you got something in your heart against somebody, against anybody from any nation, against anybody from any color, against anybody from any state, you better pray and ask the Holy Ghost to crucify that in you because you're going to have a problem when you stand before God if you let that bitterness and that hatred exist in your heart. God so loved the world. We just talked about unity, oneness. And I know it's all political to say this, and I'm not saying this because of politics. I'm saying this because Jesus said, by this will you be known as my disciples if you have love one for another. That means all. Amen, somebody? All right. You good with that? Okay. Let's go. Now, don't allow yourself to be taken by all the charged, politically motivated, socially motivated, hatred motivated, anti-church, anti-God motivated stuff that tries to get you to get caught up in division and hating people and all this other stuff. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they're married to. I don't care what kind of dress they wear or what kind of pants they wear or whether they're supposed to be wearing pants or dress. you got to learn to stand for something morally and not be against everything in your heart with hatred. We love people. And we want to see people be loved by Jesus and we want to see them repent and be saved and live for God. Somebody say amen. All right. Now, it all started with Palm Sunday, the triumphal injury. uh, injury. That's about what it was. A little slip there. The triumphal entry concluded with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. By the way, let me clear something up for you, too. Let me help you out with this. Just Just as we get started, some people say that, Jesus wasn't crucified on Thursday or Jesus wasn't crucified on Friday because it was Thursday or he didn't raise on Sunday because it wasn't the third day. He wasn't three days later, but he didn't say three days later. He said on the third day. I want to just show you a little something here that that makes it all really simple for you to understand. Let me ask you a question. When does our day start? What do we call that? Say it again. Morning. Y'all understand that, right? Our day starts in the morning. When does morning start? When the sun comes up? No, it starts at midnight. It starts at midnight. It's a trick question kind of, right? But it's true. 1 a.m. is the morning. You say, I had a bad dream last night. If you had that dream at 4, you had a bad dream today. Because that's morning. I learned it when I started being a police Because they put us on what's called morning watch. I thought, this ain't morning watch. Yeah, it is. You had to go into work at midnight and work till 8 or 9 in the morning. That's morning watch. Why? Because you're working during the morning from 1 to whenever the sun comes up. That's still morning. From 12.01, that's when our day starts. Our day ends at 11.59. 24 hours, it starts right then, okay? So listen, for the Jew, the day begins at sundown. Not at midnight or not the next day. The day begins at sundown. That's why Passover begins at sundown. From sundown to the next sundown is a full day for them. So although the Bible will show us that Jesus went into the upper room and started having Passover on Thursday evening because it was evening and the sun had gone down, it was actually Friday. Friday had already started. Does that make sense to you? Now, some people still want to debate it, but we don't have to. So here's the thing. The Bible even tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, this is where they get that. The evening and the morning were one day. It continues. If you look in chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 8, it's evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning. And people say, well, he wasn't talking about a literal day. He was talking about a reference. Okay, right. I'm not going to argue that with you. But either way, he made the reference. Even in the morning, that's where it came from. All right? You good there? So the reason that he had this Passover meal on the day that he had is because it was Passover. All right? So we're actually going to go all the way back to the Friday before, which is seven days 
before the Passover. Now, I'm going to just go through some things for the rest of this message about what Jesus did on these days. And I'm going to point out a few things. And I'm going to let the Holy Spirit just kind of point out some things to you. And when you get done, you might say, well, he didn't give us point one, point two. I don't see an outline. There's nothing in the event section. That's because God rearranged all this stuff on me at the last minute. Or maybe I rearranged it because I wasn't listening to him good enough to start off with. But either way, I didn't have time to get the outline back together. You would have been confused. Trust me, more than you probably are normally. But it's okay. Look, if you want an outline, I'll bring it to you. Dustin and him have some of the out, some of the points and, uh, and 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 some of the some of the scriptures there that you'll be able to follow along. And and so what I want to do is we're going to look at from Friday to Thursday, and then we'll look at Thursday, Friday, or, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday next week on Easter. Because those three days really just stand alone. All right? I want you to think about this question. If you knew you had one week to live, what would you do? If you knew, I got one week, this is it, what would you do? Well, here's the thing. Jesus knew he had one week. He knew it. He knew what was coming. He knew he had one week. And so the things that he did are important to us. Because what he did was everything that he could do, everything that needed to be done from then to the time that he died. So let's take a look at them. And, and, and like I said, some of them I'm just going to be naming. Some of them I'm going to be talking about a little bit. Some of them you're going to have to just glean, let the Holy Spirit going to drop something in your spirit about. But I believe by going through these and looking at these, and then next week will be totally different. But by looking at these and the way we're going to do it, that you're going to see some real truths and some very important things about this last week of Jesus' life, this Passion Week. If nothing else, you'll just know it better. How about that? But I believe it's going to be better than that. So going back to that Friday, Jesus goes through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. Remember, he already, he, the Bible said he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. He said, i got to go there. And so he goes through Jericho on Friday and he heals blind Bartimaeus. Uh, isn't it amazing that the first thing Jesus did in this holy week was open some eyes? Open some eyes. And isn't it amazing what happens when Jesus really touches our heart, when Jesus really reveals himself to us, it opens our eyes? Okay, that'll, that'll hit you on the way home. You'll be eating on a, biting down on a chicken leg. Be like, I just got that. That was good. And the chicken ain't bad either. Then he goes to eat at the house of a very, very, very short man. Zacchaeus, y'all remember him? He was a wee little man. There you go. I heard you singing that. I knew you'd be the first one. She's been teaching kids for 173 years. That was on Friday before he goes and has dinner with Zacchaeus. Here's amazing to me. Holy week. Jesus knows he's going to die. Y'all following me? Stay with me. First two things he did. Opened up some blinded eyes. Go to somebody that everybody else hated. Huh. Wow. Jesus is pretty good, ain't he? Then, by the way, on that same Friday, he tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 20, verse 18, Behold... We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. So he tells them what's going to happen. And by my, by my research and, and, and understanding, this is the third time he had told them that, but apparently every single time they were texting or looking at Facebook or something. So they didn't get it. All right, so Saturday before he arrives, it's Saturday before the, the, the Passover. So Friday he goes through Jericho. Saturday he arrives at Simon the leper's house, the Bible tells us. Now this is something very interesting here to, to me and should be for us because here's the thing. The Bible calls him Simon the leper, but lepers weren't allowed to have houses. 
Lepers didn't have houses. They weren't allowed to associate with people. In fact, they had to stay far away. And if anybody came near them, they had to scream, unclean, unclean. So a lot of people believe, and I happen to believe too, that they call him Simon the leper because it's very possible. But he was one of the lepers that Jesus healed. So not only did he open some eyes and then go to somebody that everybody else hated, he was right where the people nobody was supposed to touch. Mm. Uh. Hallelujah. I was once one of those people that everybody hated and nobody was supposed to touch. Nobody wanted to get around. But I'm glad it didn't bother him. So he has dinner at Simon's house, and this was in Bethany. John chapter 12, verse 1 tells us that it was six days before the Passover that he entered Bethany. Matthew and Mark tell us that it was at Simon's house. So that was Saturday, and then Sunday, five days before, he makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the day we celebrate Today, this is not five days before he, he made it. It's five days. When I say so many days before, I'm saying that's the days before the Passover, okay? So five days before the Passover, he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this is where they wave palm branches, right? And this is where they sang to him, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let me read it to you. It's right here in the scripture. Um, in, in, in the Bible, it says that they, they, they cried out to him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. That's in verse 13. He comes into Jerusalem and they're waving palm branches and worshiping. But let me show you something really unique. I heard one preacher say it like this and it struck me so profoundly. And I want to share this with you today. He said when they, when Jesus was being whom they wanted him to be, they gave him palms. When he was being whom they needed him to be, they gave him thorns. Many of the same people who were crying Hosanna were crying crucify. And so I want to ask you this question. How many times in our lives when Jesus is being whom we want him to be, he's blessing us, he's giving us favor, he's providing, we're having happy times. When we come to church and we wave palm branches and we say, blessed be the none who comes in the name of the Lord. But then just a week later, when he's being who we need him to be, And he's bringing us through something or out of something or taking something out of us. And he's maybe even using a trial or a hardship. And all we want to do is give him thorns. Man, I don't know if you know how good that is. You need to let that sink in. I'm going to just kind of let that marinate with you right there. So Sunday was also when he wept over Jerusalem and he said how often... Would I gather you together as babe chicks, as a mother gathered her chicks? This is when he told them, you've missed your visitation. What a sad time. So all that happened on Sunday. Monday, four days before the Passover. He goes back into Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple for the second time. See, here's the thing, a lot of people don't realize that He cleansed the temple twice. He cleansed the temple in John chapter 2 when he went to Passover for the first time. And now he cleanses the temple again when he goes to Passover for the last time. And see, this time, this is what was happening. Man, you got to stay here and you got to get this. I'm telling you, this is so rich. Just looking at what Jesus did, it preaches itself. I don't even have to bring it out, but I'm going to try to give you a little something so you know that that God's using me at least, okay? I did study a tiny bit. 
But Jesus goes, and why did he cleanse it? Why did he make a rope and do the things he did? Because here's what they were doing. They were required to come worship. And what God said was worship was, you bring the worship. You bring the animal. You bring what's required. But they were taking shortcuts. They didn't bring the animal. They would go there and buy the animal, and they were being sold animals that weren't worthy of the sacrifice in the first place and they were being overcharged for it you ever eat at six flags or in an airport you ever wondered do y'all go to mcdonald's because they don't charge what y'all charging anyways here's the thing They were taking shortcuts to worship, thinking they were going to get in the presence of God. And he cleaned it out. He said, that ain't who we are. That ain't who we're going to be. This ain't what God made, and this ain't what God accepts. And I'm telling you, you can do a lot of things if you want to, but you better not take shortcuts in worship. You better not take shortcuts in sacrifice. You don't take shortcuts when God says, worship me this way. Even when you worship with finances and stewardship, when you worship with gifts and offerings, when you worship with talents, when you worship with your songs, when you worship anyway, you only get into the presence of God by true worship from a true heart. And that's why we work so hard around here. And that's why the people that are called and anointed to do it sacrifice time, sacrifice talents. They do it unthankfully many times. But they do it to lead us in worship and to lead worship for him. See, the devil was the worshiper and he knows how to steal it. He knows how to cheat it. And this is what it was. They were taking shortcuts in their worship. And God said, I'm not going to have it. You can't get in the throne in the presence of God with shortcuts. This is also when he cursed the fig tree. Now some people say that that was symbolic of him cursing Israel. You ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah? It's been taught. It's being taught. But it's a lie. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say God cursed Israel. You're not going to see it. Let me tell you what he was doing. Let me tell you why he cursed that fig tree. Man, this is another one that's just going to... Whew, I'm going to tell you, triumphal entry is good, but this is wearing me out in some ways. I don't know about you, but I'm like, okay, God, I see what you're doing. You're making me go higher. Remember what I told you about foundational, about thriving. God is taking us higher and higher and higher, and sometimes we got to get lower to get higher. But here's what he did. He cursed that fig tree because that fig tree had leaves on it. It wasn't the right season, but it had leaves on it. So when the tree had leaves on it, that told the people it had fruit on it. And so when he got over there, it didn't have any fruit. So he cursed it. And it was, he did it for the disciples and for us, but it was just it was a point. The point he was making is he don't like hypocrites. He ain't going to bless them and he ain't going to accept them. Now he loves them, but you showing leaves? Hear me. You showing leaves that say I got fruit, but you ain't got no fruit. I don't know any plainer way to put that. That's what he was doing. (laughs) Now you cross-reference that and see if I'm not telling you the truth. So that's Monday. Now on Tuesday, he spends nearly all day teaching in the temple. You may be surprised to find out that most all of the parables that Jesus taught were taught in one day in the temple, and that was this Tuesday. A lot of us read through them and we think, well, that was all during the three years. Nope, most all of it was right there on that day on Tuesday. Go back and read it. You see, he knew he only had three days left to live, and he was in overdrive now. Matthew chapters, hey, write this down. Listen, I don't know if you have this up here, but, but maybe you just throw it up there if you can. I don't know. If you're a note taker, write this down. Make notes. Matthews chapters 21 through 26. Mark chapters 11 through 14. And Luke chapters 19 through 22. All of it was taught on that day at the temple. That's Matthew 
chapters 21 through 26, Mark 11 through 14, and Luke 19 through 22, all taught that day at the temple. Very, very important stuff. I've said this before, like when Jesus goes into the upper room with the disciples and he starts pouring out things to them. Here's the thing. I really don't want to die. Anybody in here excited about death? I'm not afraid of it. I know what's going to happen. I got Jesus. I'm excited about going to heaven. I actually preached a message a long time ago when I was a youth pastor. It was called, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven, But Nobody Wants to Die. See, God gave us this birth in us, this, this, this passion for life. I crave lungs. My lungs crave air. You know what I'm saying? I want to be alive. I don't want to die. I, I just prefer we all just get raptured out of here. But if I do, I'll tell you how I want to go. I want to go wherever it is with my babies and grandbabies if I got them. And my wife right there with me, if she's still here. And I want to tell them anything I can. When my dad passed away, he, he had to go to hospice and it took him five days to die. But those were some of the five best days I ever spent with him, believe it or not. I saw things in him. I learned things from him. I wished I'd never gone through it. Never. I want him back today. But I wouldn't trade those moments for anything. So here's Jesus, knowing how long he has left, spilling his guts out, if you will, to help us. And we say, why is it important for me to read the word? Why is it important for me to know the word? All I got to do is know Jesus. I'm going to tell you, if you don't know this word, you ain't going to know Jesus. You might know who he is, but you won't know him and his character. This is why we're talking about it. Amen, somebody? All right. So Wednesday, two days before, Mary anoints the head and the feet of Jesus. You say, well, I thought it was the head. I read it in the Bible. I thought it was the feet. I read it in the Bible. I thought it was two different times. It's the same thing. She anointed the head and the feet of Jesus. John tells us she anointed the feet. Matthew and Mark tells us she anointed the head. So we know she did both. We just have three different writers that are telling it from different perspectives. Now we know this because in Matthew 26, 12, Jesus said, You know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered to be crucified. So Jesus tells us exactly when it happens. He tells them again what's going to happen. He tells them in two days this is what's going to happen and apparently they're looking at Instagram or texting again. I'm telling you, you got to put your phones up when you're in church. Unless you're tithing. Or looking at the events app. We'll let you get away with that. If you're doing notes on your phone, that's fine. Don't let me catch you looking at Facebook. So this is also when Judas gets upset. And Jesus makes this statement in Matthew 26, verse 12. For in pouring out this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Now this was the only anointing that Jesus received for his burial. Now you remember, they had to get him off the cross in a hurry and get him in the tomb fast because it was fixing to be Sabbath. And then when they went back to anoint him because they didn't get to the first time, he wasn't there. And we'll talk about that some more next week. So here we go, Thursday, one day before, in essence, but the same evening, remember, sun went down, Friday had already started. Passover starts, and he's eating the Passover meal with his disciples. So, Friday through Thursday, I want you to look at all the things Jesus accomplished and did. Why did he do them? Man, he did them for so many reasons. So many reasons, but I got one to share with you. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love to know what Jesus said in the upper room? How many of you would like to know what Jesus said in the upper room? 
I wished I would have been Da Vinci's assistant. Right? Y'all get that? You know, he painted the... Right? I'm just, I'm just joking. I know he wasn't there. He wasn't even alive. It's a joke. I heard somebody else use it, so I figured I'd try. Y'all not laughing, so it wasn't funny, I guess. <laughs> Let me try this one. You know what Jesus said at the Last Supper, right? One of the last things he said, one of the most important things he says. If y'all want to be in this picture, you better get on this side of the table. <laughs> Thank you, I'll be here all week. <laughs> This is a joke. It's okay. You want to know what Jesus said in the upper room? Here, you ready for this? Write this down. John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. This is what Jesus said during the Passover meal. This is what he said and what he did on that Thursday night, which really was Friday morning. And he said this, and he, he, he talked some about the second coming, but he also talked some about him coming back just three days later. You remember we talked about this last Easter when he told them, I'm telling you this. He said, I'm telling you this now, so when it happens, you will believe. And he's also saying this about the second coming as well. And can I tell you this? Believe. He's coming again. He's coming again. He's alive right now. We're, we're going to celebrate that next week. We can celebrate it every day. Every day is resurrection day. Amen? He's alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. One of these days, the Father's going to look over. He's going to say, Gabriel, start the show, son. And Gabriel's going to put that trumpet to his lips. I heard one pastor say, I believe he's warming up the mouthpiece right now, getting ready. And, and listen, he's going to blow that trumpet, and the Bible says Jesus is going to step out on them eastern clouds, and the dead in Christ will rise, and then those of us that remain will be caught up to meet with him in the air, and so shall we ever be with him. Can I tell you something? That when he comes on that day, nobody's going to have a hard time believing it. But he said right there in that room, I'm telling you all of this. You want to know why it's important to know what he did? You want to know why I took this time now about 40, 43 minutes? I know y'all think I preach forever, but I really don't. It just takes me a while to get there. You want to know why we're doing this and talking about what we're doing? You want to know why we said it's not good to hate the Jews and we need to love people and get all this bitterness and stuff out of your heart? Because Jesus wants us to know it so people can see us living it so they can believe like we believe because that's the only thing that's going to help. I'm telling you this so you will believe. That's the point of it all. That's why he did what he did. That's why he lived how he lived. That's why he died the way he died so we can believe. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you today, if you don't believe, you need to find a place where you can. You need to, you need to find a place because can I tell you this, as excited as I am about standing before Jesus and seeing him face to face, if you stand before him that day and you're not saved and you don't have Jesus in your heart and you can be smug and you can think you're smart and you can think you know everything because many just like you have gone on before, but I've seen a lot of people leave this world and I've never seen anybody die a true atheist. You stand before Jesus and you don't have him in your heart and you're not saved it's not gonna go well it's not gonna be good can I, can I tell you something just as real as heaven is so is hell so is hell and there's a real hell to shun and there's a real eternity that is awful and so Jesus has given us opportunities right now at least cry out and say, Lord, help me. I don't believe, God. I'm, I'm arrogant, God. I'm frustrated, God. I'm, I'm prideful, God. I'm, I think I know everything, God. I haven't been taught, God. I, I just can't see it, God. Whatever the case is, if it's real, help my unbelief. Show me. 
And he'll do with you just like he's been doing for many, 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 many millions and billions of others throughout time. He will show himself real to you. But let me tell you something, friend. Don't take another second without Jesus. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, I thank you and I bless you. This is the day that you've given us. And we rejoice and we're glad in it, God. So I ask you today, Lord, to help us to do what it is you said. You told us all. You told us everything for. So we can believe. So we can believe. So God, if there's one person here that's struggling with that belief, if there's one person here that doesn't know you as their Savior, if there's one person here, God, that doubts, or maybe they've been playing games, or, or maybe they've been shortcutting the worship, God, or, 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 or they've been doing something different, or, or, or they're, they're, they're showing leaves, God, but the fruit's not there. Whatever the case is, God, I pray that they would repent and turn their heart to you right now because you're calling us out. You're calling our name. And right now, God, boldly, at 12.17 on March 28th, 2021, without a single note playing, I ask you to save us, Lord. Reach down and touch our hearts, God, as we cry out to you. And friend, let me tell you, the Bible says if you call out to Jesus, you will be saved. It's not that difficult. It's not that hard. All you got to do is say, I'm here, Lord, help me, save me. I'm going to repent. That means I'm going to turn away from my ways and I'm going to follow you. And he will do it. He already has done the work and he's ready for you to come home. Maybe you say, I, I, I've known Jesus. I've been saved, but I've just been walking away. I've been, I've been lonely. I've, I've, I've been fooled. I've been tricked. I've been thinking all this other stuff. I've been whatever the case is, but I want to come home. Come on. Come on, it's just that easy. Just do like Peter did. Come back and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. What a, what a time starting Holy Week as we're going to celebrate Easter Resurrection next Sunday to come home to Jesus. Come home. Come home. Come home. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That you gave it all for us so that we could live with you. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. If that's you and you're glad of it, say amen. 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 God bless you. I love you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer maybe for the first time or you came back home today, I want you to click that link if you're out there in the internet. If you're here, share it with somebody. Come let me know. We want to celebrate with you. If, 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 listen, if you don't have a place to be next week, I want you to come worship with us. Now, let me give you a quick little update on where we are. COVID is being changed uh, uh, in, in several different ways. Um, CDC recommendations are now three feet for social distancing. And so we are going to make a few changes. Everybody stick your arm out in front of you. Okay, that's about three feet. That means you're not going to touch the person in front of you. And when they're standing up, you're not going to touch them either. Y'all don't understand. I said out, not over. <laughs> just like a kid. Just like a, just like, I, all right, I'm sorry. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep two chairs in between each family, but we're going to start going to every row instead of every other row. All right? Starting next week. Now, right over in this section, if we can, and we'll, we'll move it to somewhere else if we need to, we're going to have a safer zone. We're going to be safe everywhere, but we'll have a safer zone. So if you still feel like you need a little extra space, we're going to put you right over here, and you're just fine. Come on. If you want to wear your mask, as always, just like we've been from the beginning, wear a mask, be safe. If you don't, don't be safe. Amen? And we're going to keep worshiping God. We're going to keep moving with them out. Some other changes are going to be coming soon. I'm ready to start praying for somebody. I miss laying hands on people and giving some hugs. If somebody asked me about the vaccine. Is the vaccine out there? Yes. Do you want it? If you want it, get it. If you need it, get it. I, you know, when they say, well, what about all this? What about all that? I, I don't know. 
I don't know. I, 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 I trust God, I, but you know what? I go to the doctor when I can't see. I got these glasses right here because if I take them off, I can't read nothing. And I like reading and I like driving still. I don't want them taking my driver's license away. All right? I know there's a lot of different debates out there. I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just saying, but between so many people and vaccinations and all the things that are happening with immunity and stuff, I'm ready for this thing to get gone. Amen, somebody? And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to move to this next week. And uh, so hopefully you're good with that. If, if you want to stay home and stay safe there, keep staying home, staying safe. But I'm telling you, you're better off here. Amen? I'm glad we got that, but I sure don't want to not be together with the people of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you, our ushers, to come dismiss you from the, front, uh, from the back to the front. Don't, don't hang out in the lobby. Uh, it's not raining, so the parking lot's the new lobby. We love you. God bless you.